Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Frank Pellocrasas, and I'll be uh, the moderator for today. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by uh, BS Group, and it's called uh, Vessel Optimization Compliance. Today is the second session, uh, specifically focusing on performance monitoring. The sponsors of today's session are NAPA, Hopper, Vessel Performance Solutions, and Tress, all of whom will be presenting later. So, um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'll be the moderator and I will start off uh, today's uh, session with a presentation of my own. So, uh, can everyone see in uh, full screen mode? Because I cannot tell. Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. So, um, I represent Baron Shelter Ship Management, and today's presentation is going to be about analytics in uh, large scale fleet management. My name is Frank Pello Crassus, as I mentioned before. Uh, my background is naval architecture and marine engineering, and I've been working with the Shelter Group for the last 12 years. A couple of notes regarding the Schulte Group. We are an integrated uh, maritime uh, solutions provider, starting with uh, tonnage from the ship owning side, going on to ship management services, as well as maritime services, uh, such as uh, uh, supervision, uh, software development, and a host of others. BSM is uh, managing approximately 600 ships in total, 400 under full management out of 11 ship management locations. Our fleet manages uh, uh, sorry, is, uh, all types and sizes. And uh, with that in mind, uh, we come to uh, the topic of today's uh, presentation. So um, we are presented uh, in Bernard Schulte with a, a unique challenge, and that is to manage a fleet of uh, so many different types and sizes. And on top of this, to do it centrally and be able to aggregate uh, all the information in a way that becomes actionable. As such, five years ago, uh, we started a department called Fleet Performance, uh, nowadays called Voyage Performance, which uh, focuses on exactly these aspects. So what we're going to walk through today is uh, all the tools that we have built as a, uh, as a result for all of these uh, business requirements. So the, we overall follow a digital twin uh, methodology. Every ship that comes into uh, our management, uh, is uh, we build a digital twin for it and continuously benchmark its performance against it. Everything that is reported daily through our systems is uh, normalized uh, before benchmarking. We combine manual data streams as, uh, with telemetry data streams because we need to be able to uh, manage all ships in the same manner, respective of whether they have telemetry capability or not. We do use uh, hindcast weather data for benchmarking and for better resolution. We have an automated diagnostic and targeted alert system. And through all this, of course, we manage uh, all emissions for our own internal benchmarking purposes, as well as for external reporting purposes such as MRV and IMO DCS and whatever is coming over the next few years. Likewise, in engine performance, uh, we are able to assess the performance of, uh, of all types of engines, two-stroke and four-stroke uh, inline V-type, as well as dual fuel engines. Uh, the way that we've structured everything we take into account, uh, based on the digital twin, of course, that I mentioned before, uh, the exact engine type, uh, its layout and everything, so that the crew is only needing to uh, report exactly what is required. The results are uh, presented in, uh, in way of a dashboard, again, benchmarking against the digital twin that I mentioned before, and there are always long-term trends uh, with limits that, again, alert, uh, trigger alerts to the, the system that we mentioned before. Moving one level up, uh, of course, we need to aggregate and understand where everything is, uh, so we have a host of tools. I do apologize for the, uh, for the amount of information on this slide, but uh, this is uh, this is directly, of course, uh, from our production uh, environment, and it represents aggregated uh, information for over 400 ships. Uh, it's heavily redacted, of course, because as you can imagine, we're talking about uh, some sensitive information. So 
apart from uh, being able to monitor selected fleet, uh, we are also able to monitor sister ships. And then again, uh, the performance of the entire fleet, which we nowadays are starting to link with personnel performance as well. So all of this, of course, because we don't want to just drop information uh, on people that is not what we're trying to achieve. We are trying to empower decision making. So we started off with uh, descriptive analytics, which is uh, something that you're all very well aware. We do a whole cleaning. We measure how much uh, fuel is being saved and all that. We have recently moved into predictive analytics, uh, understanding when uh, um, how performance, sorry, hull cleaning needs to take place so as to uh, keep the ship's uh, hull in an optimum condition. And we're slowly moving to prescriptive analytics, whereby by combining a number of analytics, we're able to uh, provide uh, precise instructions or recommendations to the crew as to what needs to be done you know, to achieve the optimal condition. We are uh, uh, putting a low focus on telemetry nowadays, and to this regard, we uh, uh, embarked on a joint venture with a technology company called uh, Navidium, uh, with who we have a joint venture specifically with, uh, for uh, developing solutions that are uh, focusing on voyage performance and near real-time uh, performance management. Um, our focus this year is actually going to be on onboard analytics so that we are able to provide through edge computing the, uh, uh, the decision support tools directly to the people that are able to uh, make corrective action, meaning our crews, not people from the shore side. All of this is, of course, possible for us because we have our own software development house called Mariaps, which is able to provide a holistic turnkey solution for all uh, aspects of our uh, of ship management. So uh, we are able to have everything under one platform, starting from uh, uh, the classic uh, daily performance to, uh, to maintenance and uh, what have you, going on to training, dry dock, and a whole host of other things. What we are actually moving towards is the same platform starting from electronic log logbooks and uh, that type of audited entry on board, empowered by telemetry wherever possible to, uh, uh, to fill in reports uh, if possible, and going all the way to the analytics end of the chain. So all of the solutions that uh, we, we showed you today are the tools that we use internally in BSM, but are, of course, also available for third parties uh, in case of interest. So our difference, uh, we have 138 years uh, experience in shipping, and everything that you have seen, uh, which is, of course, just a small uh, part of the cake, uh, has been developed because of in-house development needs. We're not a tech, uh, sorry, a technology company that developed product specifically for sales. We developed it to do our job better. So all of this is continuously empowered and refined using uh, in-house active expertise. And at the end of the day, as, uh, as I mentioned, everything is integrated in is under one platform. So that's all for me today. Thank you very much for your attention. So um, bear with me while I switch to the next speaker. Who is Osi Metala. So uh, Osi Metala. Uh, has experience in the industry for over 10 years. With his naval architecture background, has been working with ship design and many novel machinery solutions. The focal point has always been uh, research and development and energy efficiency, including ship system simulations, onboard audits, training, and consultation. Whether it has been about ship design or operation, OSI has always been involved in pushing the industry digitalization forward. Currently, OSI Metala is working as a customer success manager for Napa Shipping Solutions to provide state-of-the-art performance monitoring and voyage optimization solutions, even for the industry segments where high-frequency sensor data is not always available. Thank you, Frank. Let me start by sharing my screen. OK. 
Okay, let me know if you cannot see anything, but um, hello and greetings from the, I guess, snowy Finland. Uh, I heard that there are many of you on the other side of the screen, and I'm, of course, very pleased to hear that. And I'm happy to open, uh, open today's session and tell you about NAPA and maximizing uh, operational efficiency by analyzing data. Yes, Frank? Yeah, now we can see it. That's all. Okay, perfect. Let's go then. So, not much about myself. Frank already introduced me, but I've always been working with the energy efficiency and digital solutions. And I'm currently working as a customer success manager and proudly representing NAPA. As many of you probably already know, uh, NAPA has been providing data led solutions for safety, efficiency, and productivity in both ship design and operations. And this includes various ship design solutions for naval, architect, art, naval architects and shipyards, and, if, and electric logbooks, loading and emergency computers for ship owners, and performance monitoring and optimization for operators and onboard use. We have over 30 years of experience and our turnover is approximately 20, 26 million euros. We have 190, approximately 190 employees around the globe in offices in 10 different countries. The main office being in Helsinki, Finland, but we have also big offices in Japan, China, Korea, United States, Romania, and also smaller hubs across the globe. We are very proud of the fact that the 95% of the ships built these days are built and are designed by using NAPA solutions. And across all of our solutions, we have over 12,000 active users. We are also very active in research and in consortiums with other industry uh, partners and um, universities. A couple of examples here. Flare being a project where it targets a risk-based methodology for live flooding risk assessment and control by developing a generic and holistic risk models. Uh, the Vesela AI is an EU-funded project which develops a framework that facilitates modeling and prediction of ship's behavior using digital twin technology. And the Intense is a business Finland-funded research industry consortium to proactively ad advance, promote, and digitalize Finnish maritime industry with a special focus on energy efficiency and emissions of the ship energy systems. And speaking of about the data and the research, the, the starting point for improving and um, analyzing the data should always be the purpose def definition. And when and need for the maximize operational efficiency. The starting point is not should not be the data definition, but rather its purpose and the end goal. Um, as with everything, uh, the continuous improvement requires a systematic approach to the problem. So you have to always understand where you're coming from, where you're going to, and then reflect backwards. Uh, by defi defining and describing the purpose, um, that can be ecological, meaning a CO2 or SOX reductions, or financial, reducing the pure fuel costs or other operational expenses. Or on the other side, just purely regulatory, meaning EU, MRV or IMO DCS being one of the examples. Uh, this can, of course, overlap with each other, uh, meaning that the fuel costs translate quite directly, or, or fuel reduction translate directly to reduced uh, CO2 emission, but not, as, not necessarily. As we all know, um, financial decisions are not always linked directly to the ecological improvements. And once we have the purpose defined, it's start time. To, it's time to look into the improvement areas. So, are we look, talking about just voyage-based weather optimization and weather routing or speed optimization? Or is, are we taking a bigger picture looking at the fleet-wide just-in-time operational planning with ERP or just drilling down into details about 
auxiliary engine usage, uh, ballast weather management system usage, or just air conditioning in the larger passenger vessels. So it's about also about defining a scope. And once you have the scope, it's time to go for the system selection. So are we using an Excel only to follow up, then record the results, or are we going for the third part? solutions and doing the bigger investments. The next step would be, of course, implementing the system and defining the baseline, where we are coming from and what is the current status. Uh, the change, of course, has to be measurable and quantifiable, because otherwise there might not be the linkage between the cause and the effect. And once the whole system is ready, it's time to plan and execute the improvement. Um, it's also it's important to benchmark the results, keep iterating and retain the continuous improvement so that the change is continuous. And I also added my favorite quote there in the end from Marilyn Strathern, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure, meaning that the sub-optimization should be always uh, keeping consideration and avoid it because, you know, if the KPI that you're looking for is transport work done annually, it may not directly translate into better financial situation or ecological impact. Uh, the next step would of course be looking at the data itself. So in general, the amount of data produced by the industry is, as we all know, is growing very fast. And this has been true for high profile vessels for a long time, for example, uh, cruise vessels, but it's starting to become reality also for the more common merchant cargo fleet. And this is, the whole data issue is becoming more and more like data, data governance challenge in more micro and macro level. Mm -hmm. And the whole data entity requires their interfaces to generate value. And this interface can be between system to system or the system to human. But at its core, uh, especially in the ocean crossing operations, and the highest fuel savings can be quite often uh, get from a very crude uh, high level data also. So operational improvements can be made based on the publicly available data alone with substance, substance expertise. And because in many cases, the, uh, the key to the success or, or proper implementation implementation of this system is the accessibility of the data to ensure that all the parties, technical managers, operational managers, captains on board, port authorities, the whole log logistics chain have the access to the same information. If that can be utilized, big, big savings can, be ha can happen. And for example, we did late last year a study where we looked into the operations between Europe and US East Coast uh, in between certain ports and certain the vessel types, and we found that the just pure using AIS data, weather data, and vessel information available, available, available publicly, we were able to optimize the routing and reduce 16% of the fuel cost and improve time charter equivalent TCE by nearly 8%. And of course, we didn't allow ourselves a benefit or having knowing more than the operators and captains would have had at the time. So with very little data, with very little information, a big impact can be made if combined with the right people and the right knowledge. So as explained, the holistic understanding is very valuable and rarely just big data itself or extensive analysis, black box AI models. They don't always produce the uh, the best outcome fastest. Because the vessel itself as a technical unit works as a common nominator for this data. So the, the ships, they operate in very complex uh, multi-domain environmental uh, interfacing with weather and the sea and the, the business element of the industry as well as technical aspects. We're talking about global weather data, waves, winds, tidal, conditions, AIS data, but not from that one vessel only, but for 
whole global merchant fleet also to ensure safety. Chart data, meaning where the vessels can and cannot operate, where they should and shouldn't operate. New data, which can range from different formats and, and styles from vessel to vessel and fleet to fleet, and as well as automation signals. And as I was explained, the common denominator for all of this da data is the vessel. And understanding the vessel around it, you can create uh, very specific and uh, very high quality results by by analyzing the system. And, it, and that enables us and the users to draw conclusions and, and explain the relations between the cost and the effect when the aforementioned changes are implemented. And in general, the um, maximized data quantity doesn't always directly translate into maximized results uh, because it's very important to understand the fundamentals of the business and understand the fundamentals of the of the vessels as a technical unit so that the highest quality results can be drawn fastest and most cost efficiently. Um, and for technical performance analysis, one of course must combine the environmental data with the vessel records. So as was explained, the vessels operate in, in environments where we're considering the winds and the waves and sea tidal currents and all that. So it is a very complex equation to put together. So, so one can approach this uh, problem by looking at the high frequency data available from the vessels, meaning the uh, torque measurements from the shaft line and, and turbo intake temperatures and RPMs and all that, or just look at the hand recorded noon and logbook data from the vessels. But um, but the less data there is available, of course, more technical substance knowledge is needed to fill the gaps, to, be, to draw the bigger picture, understand the, the whole ending questions. Uh, uh, for example, if only noon records and weather data is available, they, the understanding is needed uh, to, connect the, uh, to connect the dots between the fuel consumption and the weather and performance. So let me show you, for example, on this one case here, where we have fuel consumption in noon, noon level, one column representing one day of fuel consumption. Uh, we can see that the beginning of July, this vessel's speed was dropped, the orange line there. It dropped quite significantly, even though the fuel consumption level was still re relatively constant, 10 metric tons per day. But we can also see that by running the analysis, understanding the entity and all the elements affecting, we can see that the, there was quite significant sea impact of the weather included here, the blue line. So we can draw a conclusion that the, uh, the drop speed was a result from very bad weather in this case. Similarly, on the graph below, we can see that the um, when doing the continuous monitoring, continuous follow-up with the vessel, we can see that the performance is always reducing. The hollow fouling level is increasing. And these are the conclusions that we can draw from just noon reports, just weather data, and enhanced with substance knowledge that there is. Uh, now I would like to take also a chance to show you the solutions that we are promoting and how we are going approaching these problems. So Napa Fleet Intelligence relies on public available big data, the AIS and the weather and all that, as well as combining that with the vessel noon reports and Napa enhancing everything with the Napa generated vessel specific performance models. So we don't need any necessarily need any heavy commissioning or any or high initial investments or anything like that. But it's a matter of combining the data, combining the weather, combining everything with the technical knowledge that there is. We can look at the performance on, on a voyage basis. So how well port to port the vessel is operating, is the 
are the navigational decisions sufficient? Or what is the big picture when operating? And that's making proactive, even corrective measurements based on the information that the users can re get from the system. On the other way around, we can also look at the at the vessel in a more technical point of view. So continuous improvement requires continuous monitoring. So how well the um, what is the trend line of the hull fouling for the vessel? What is today's situation for the um, uh, for the fuel consumption in different weather conditions, different drafts, and all that? Of course, charter party comp compliance is a very big topic and in this business. So looking at the performance from performance warranty points of view and providing analytics on that, because we have today that we can combine it in a system like this. And also, of course, the weather, con weather routing and the weather optimization. From port to port, combining the weather, combining the vessel performance, we can create very accurate uh, and very much optimized routing alternatives for the captains and ship operators alike based on the data that is available. But I'd like to thank you again and please be in touch with me in the email address below and I'll happily take questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ossi. Um, as, as you already said, uh, questions for Napa will come at the end of the session. So uh, moving on to Hoppe, Marine, uh, and uh, my, my friend uh, Hauke, who I know quite well from my days in Hamburg. So uh, Hauke has been working in the uh, shipping industry since 2007. Uh, he started off uh, hands-on in the production and service of valves for uh, major maritime equipment suppliers. He then diverted into the role uh, as a sales engineer. His focus has always been the digitalization of shipping, ranging from uh, measurement technology to data acquisition and also including experience in cybersecurity testing of uh, vessels. Uh, this year, recently, uh, Hauke was appointed as a head of uh, sales for the Hopper Marine Group. Congratulations as well, uh, Hauke. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. <laughs> yes, uh, you're right. We saw each other a lot in Hamburg. Um, thanks for the nice introduction here. Um, uh, also in Greece, so I hope uh, everybody here um, is able to travel soon again because for me um, the business is a big part uh, comes to that uh, is the face-to-face -face business. Um, so let's hope we go there and actually that is um, also part of my topic today. Um, Ossi mentioned something that you can do a lot of things without telemetry, without sensors, but at some certain points you will definitely need to go into higher frequency data, into onboard measurement equipment. And um, during your voyage into digitalization and into performance optimization, you will get to this point sooner or later. So my topic today is the topic high quality data and how to achieve them during COVID. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit of our experience with the situation as it is for almost one year in terms of data collection systems and high quality data. So how are we gonna do that? Just a few key facts about Hopper for those of you who don't know us. Um, there we are in the maritime business for almost 70 years um, with uh, five offices worldwide, um, more than 200,000 10 gauging system uh, sensors installed. Um, we are a diversified group. Um, the message here is, of course, we are, have been there for a long time. We are diversified in the maritime group through mostly all types of vessels. So um, whatever you do, we will be at your site. So coming to the topic, high quality data and how to get them during COVID. Whoever tried to install a data logger um, from any of the companies during the last year um, will definitely um, had some challenges and those are the ones that I'm going to share with you. But starting with what could be the reasons for that? There could be several reasons. I will not go into the details because they differ a lot, but um, 
there are legal um, topics, environmental regulations. Uh, you need to improve your OPEX. CAPEX can be a topic, monitoring some certain equipment, um, going above and beyond predictive maintenance of some certain pumps. We hope, for example, also is supplying anti-healing systems on board container vessels, especially with uh, motors as big as almost 200 kilowatts. So these are big capex inside a vessel, of course, not as big as the main engine, but big enough to be, let's say, well, they basically OPEX uh, actually, but the investment, if you do that, is, is quite significant. So we need to, to do, um, to optimize the profit, to, to have a substantial and uh, tangible business. And now, Imagine you are this nice guy in the boat and uh, you have bought any kind of a nice platform tool, like Aussie explained to us, the Napa tool, which uh, definitely is, is a very good one. Um, and there are many others which will help you to stay ahead in this in this business. So um, you're already there. You can see the dollars at the end. You will see your savings. But um, what I want to discuss with you is the challenge before the challenge. So um, on the one hand side, the one of the challenges is which we have, which is hopefully soon over, but who knows that actually, especially in Europe, it's quite a, a tough time for us, but also on the, of course, in the US and other regions as well. So we want to do this. And despite COVID, we need to stay ahead. Um, but we have the travel restriction. There's lots of things about remote commissioning going on. Um, in this, I will dive in a little bit. You need to cooperate with the classification societies, but also, um, and this is something Hoppe has uh, decided strategically, you need to know what you want to achieve. Which platform am I using? Do I have all the necessary data inside, either manually or do I have them automatically? And are these data also reliable? And believe me, we have a lot of experience. If they are reliable after commissioning, that doesn't necessarily mean that they stay reliable for a longer uh, time. You have to, let's say, you have to do a lot of maintenance on this. So my um, suggestion, when you implement something like a tool, um, is make a gap analysis for the agreed target and have a look what kind of additional sensors might I need. And in this case, talk to your platform company what they can do for you, what you want to achieve this uh, with them, but also with your data acquisition or IoT provider. Because if they know what you want to achieve, it's much easier for them to go. We have decided strategically not to go in any platform because it's a very um, good idea, in our opinion, to stay in the area which you're good at. So with Hoppe, you are getting all everything, inc to, including quality checked data through a public API, which can be published into basically any system. It can be a ship owner system like the Mariaps tool Frank is, is uh, has been presenting. This can be um, tools like the Blue Tracker, Nevis, Storm Geo, DNVL, Napa. Many of those have already hooked up and, and soon of course more are there. And whenever there's a demand, we are going into this. So you need to get the system up and running and you need to have the right and the proper data. Okay, let's go on board the vessel. So this is one of the examples, which actually is a very nice one, um, was part of a research project, but of course there have been remote commissionings done um, on normal commercial trading vessels. Uh, this one is uh, by incident, a Bernard Schulte vessel, which uh, is part of a, pr a research project called B0, which means bridge zero. So we are testing the development of a temporarily autonomously operating ship it's an unmanned bridge um, corresponding to the unmanned engine room, which is being tested for the next two years um, to achieve um, yeah, an unmanned uh, temporary operation. We have a dynamic draft system inside to actually see the real floating conditions of this ship. It's uh, going to test around with auto ballasting. Um, it's going to consider the performance of the vessel, but of course has a lot of uh, other stakeholders in where like uh, the electronic knock, the logbook from Nautilus log and, and others as well. So the big challenge was that we started this project in the middle of COVID and everything was funded. The equipment was ready. We wanted to go on board, was not possible. 
um, from other projects in the commercial uh, sector, we were having a lot of experience and um, we were uh, actually implementing this in the research project in even a bigger scale. So um, what we have supplied is a mobile system uh, consisting of an LTE antenna, a mobile connection box, which you can just put somewhere on, on the vessel, wherever you like, um, a local connection box, which is lo usually located uh, in the engine room, and an LTE tablet. So um, because what we have seen is that if you want to do a remote commissioning or remote supported commissioning, and I'm not talking about the Google Glass augmented reality things, which, which might be there in some research projects, um, which are really focusing on this, but I mean, really hands on. We want to introduce something hands on. So um, we have seen a reduction of communication of about 85% with this tool set. So even equipment which we were requiring to make commissioning by our staff, for example, our torque meters, we were sending dispatching service engineers throughout the world because we had to give warranty and you need to make the, the proper settings and parameterization on board the vessel of these devices. Even those things which were previously not being touched by a ship's crew or by a service provider which has been ordered locally by a, a ship owner, um, all of these things have been easily commissioned together with our remote supported um, stuff. So as you can see this uh, nice gentleman there, that's actually one of the real guys who was doing this. Um, he was having this tablet, he had to make some uh, terminal connections. He could easily, uh, all his questions, make a video conference inside the engine room, inside the passageway, was no problem, very high communication speed, um, and uh, the, the, the time frame to do all this has been significantly reduced. So my message here is, it is definitely possible, because for some things you need the sensors, it is definitely possible to, even in COVID and travel restrictions, to um, uh, get the system up and running as fast or almost as fast as it was possible before. I was talking a little bit about the um, setup that, that Hoppe is doing and um, this one explains this a little bit better. So what we have is that we have um, all the data acquisition system. Um, we have a little bit of an onboard visualization, but just uh, let's say to get the bare minimum, it's not a, it's not a must. Um, if there's anything that, that you have developed or a service platform provider has developed, it's definitely something that um, is not a must have. So we can basically connect to everything and have done this to main engines, to uh, remote control systems, to torque meters, to flow meters, to the automation system, uh, to the loading computer, to draft sensors, to whatsoever, everything that you, to seawater cooling pumps, frequency converters, everything that could be of interest um, can be connected. Vessel specifically also, for example, uh, we see a lot of different tags in a uh, tanker vessel compared to a container vessel, for example, and also again for, for cruise vessels. So this is nothing new. Everything is then transmitted um, by our data butler, the guy who's buttering the data, the, the, he's servicing the data to a shore side server um, and given to the public API to, to the customer directly. Uh, it's given to the Hopper team access if um, agreed to um, reduce also troubleshooting. With this remote access, you can also reduce troubleshooting times by 90%, which is very important because if you have the data on board, if it's providing the data, then also you want to have um, the data to be um, always correct. And if not, they must be made available very quickly. Now talking about the high quality data. You can already see there is the so-called data inspector, which is a service that we offer because we as the maker of many of the sensors, but also having a broad knowledge of uh, other sensors, which we are not the maker of, we want to give only good data to our clients or to the companies the clients entrusted with making or supporting them with decision support tools. So just in very brief, Five steps to get the high quality data. First thing is what I mentioned with the gap analysis. Um, we must be sure that the right parameters are there. Data need to be validated from very easy things like min, max thresholds whatsoever through correlation matrices like we do this, uh, for example, very simple. 
uh, in a, um, a bulk carrier, for example, when the auxiliary boiler is uh, running, um, the main engine should not be running. So it's a negative correlation and there are many other correlations. So also to dive into deep analysis uh, or deeper analysis to see if the operational profile fits the telemetry data. Because um, we have seen a lot that sensors are drifting, all this can be tackled with this. And of course, we as a maker of many of the equipment, we go even deeper. So the equipment that, that we place on the vessel, like torque meters, like flow meters, we are not only transmitting the flow or the torque, we are transmitting the frequency of the devices, the currents, the voltages, because we can do predictive maintenance on our devices. And our systems are giving advices, hey, dear crew, please do a calibration job or please do a, a setting job or please check the parameters. Something is wrong. It's not working well. In order to always have the high quality set of data. A lot of that is um, already taken care of by the systems on board. Um, but of course, the data needs to be maintained. Therefore, we have uh, um, included this um, data inspector services. Means there's really 24-7 somebody sitting in front of your vessels and looking into the quality of the data. He's not giving any advices to the crew. He is not saying, please uh, put your course five degrees north. Um, he's just making sure that the data which is fed into the platform is properly serviced. And of course, very importantly, always um, um, uh, mentioned, but sometimes forgotten data needs to be available. So with Hopper, we have developed this two tools. I was mentioning already the data butler. The data butler um, makes the data available with uh, easy access 24 seven worldwide. Everything is very, very uh, well treated in terms of cybersecurity. Um, what we have here is data collection is detached from analytics. So it's not a must have to have the data inspector. If there is some tools who are taking care of the, the quality of the data, we don't claim to be the, the, the partner, but of course, if a lot of hopper sensors are installed, it absolutely makes sense to go with the data inspector. And of course, with the data butler already comes remote services, troubleshooting and everything, which is very valuable um, to keep the data on a high quality level. So um, the data inspector then makes sure that all the measurement data is um, correctly set and is permanently um, maintained because now we are back in the money maker uh, section, good data enables good decisions and you can be very secure that everything that you do in a NAPA tool um, or in the VPS tool or with many other clients is um, or other platform providers is um, tangible data and leads to good sex, uh, success. And therefore we are there for you. So um, I'm not sure, uh, sorry, uh, to, uh, Frank, I'm not any 100% uh, sure if I opted for Q&A now or if it was <laughs> in the end. So, um, and I also don't know if I still have time for that. Please go ahead. <laughs> You're still muted, Frank, at least in my. Okay, yeah, you opted for Q&A later, thankfully, because you are over the time. Oh. Well, I, I will hold it against you. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. So thank you very much for that, uh, Hauke, very interesting. Um, so we move on to Maria Topanoglu from Pantheon Tankers and Alpha Balkers. So Maria has held the position of Energy Performance Manager at Pantheon Tankers and Alpha Balkers since uh, 2018. She is responsible for the performance monitoring of more than 60 vessels, the majority of which are equipped with online data acquisition systems. Prior to her current role, she worked at Minerva for 21 years as performance engineer, uh, as new building senior engineer and as head of energy efficiency. Proficient in energy efficiency and environmental compliance issues with demonstrated experience in technical tasks, she has been responsible for a number of new buildings, other projects, including uh, scrubbers and performance monitoring applications. She has been actively involved in the development of a diesel engine diagnostic system for four and two stroke combustion engines in cooperation with the School of Mechanical Engineer at the National Technical University of Athens. Maria holds a master's degree in naval architecture and marine engineering from the National Technical University of Athens and a master's degree in maritime studies from the University of Piraeus. So. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Can you see my presentation? 
Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much for the detailed introduction. Um, what I would like to share with you in my presentation, which I believe it's uh, quite uh, short, uh, is our experience with uh, the preparation uh, for the forthcoming 2023 emissions regulations. Uh, let me uh, give you a short introduction of our companies. Uh, Alpha Bikers is a um, a company specializing in the management of uh, large dry cargo vessels. Uh, we own 33 bulk carriers of virus, various sizes. Uh, Pantheon Tangiers uh, is a new company. It was established in 2012. 2012. We already have 30 tangiers from MRs to VLCCs, including many eco designs. And we have a very significant new buildings portfolio. Uh, regarding the performance monitoring, we have inst installed online monitoring systems in uh, 35 in-service vessels. Um, we follow a combination of outsourced data collection and signal processing and in-house analytics. Uh, we installed telemetry in, uh, as a standard feature in all our new buildings. And we also uh, use the conventional noon reporting. Uh, and we integrate various databases. We integrate in a common database the auto log data and uh, the NUM reports, manual entries we are receiving from the vessels. Uh, as we all know, after 2023, uh, IMO uh, has approved uh, draft new mandatory regulations to cut the CO2 emissions of existing ships. And these draft regulations would require uh, ships to combine a technical and operational uh, measure uh, to reduce their emissions through two, two indexes, the energy efficiency existing ship index as a technical measure and the um, carbon density index being the operational measure. Uh, regarding the um, EXI, uh, it is a carbon copy of the energy efficiency design index for the new buildings. Uh, the guidelines for the calculation of VXI is already is only a draft at the moment and will be finalized uh, in June 2021 at the next uh, committee, IMO committee 76. Um, the attained energy efficiency um, existing ship index is required to be calculated for all ships above uh, 400 gross tonnes and must meet the required energy efficiency uh, value, uh, which is based on a reduction factor expressed as a percentage of uh, the phase zero EDI, uh, which for the case of the tankers and the bulk carriers, this is between 15 to 20 percent reduction compared to, to the reference EDI. The simplified formula of EXI is this one, the one you can see. And from this formula, we can understand that the ways to improve the attained EXI to, to comply with the required value is either to reduce the maximum continuous rating of main engine by limiting the engine power or to increase the reference speed. And this increase can be achieved by applying measures like uh, advanced coatings, low friction coatings, uh, pre swill ducts, PBCFs, uh, change the propellers and install more efficient propellers for uh, other similar uh, measures. Um, the most, the major impact on the EXI uh, is given by the engine power limitation, the reduction of the maximum power of the main engine. And this is the easiest way for older vessels to meet the EXI requirements. Um, it is a measure, it is a, a solution that requires minimal changes from the vessel, does not change the performance of the main engine. We just, uh, you just uh, uh, limit the maximum power delivered from the engine. It is a semi-permanent limit, uh, which means that it can be overridden. And uh, it has the lower, lowest cost, which is the, I believe for the owners is the most important aspect. Um, there is um, a very simple formula, this one, uh, 
uh, with which you can uh, calculate the required engine power limitation in order to meet um, um, the XI required. Uh, if you know, if we know how much our uh, attained the, uh, the attained EXI of the vessel exceeds the required value, um, we can calculate the percentage of the power limitation to be applied. Uh, it has been recognized that if the required uh, engine power limitation does not limit the maximum power of the engine below the power ships already use, it will uh, not result in significant reduction in ship speed or uh, CO2 emissions. And we have seen that actually the vessels do operate well below this uh, required engine power limitations. Um, at least most of the tankers and their back carriers have been operated at speed and engine load that are unaffected by the EPL required. In our fleet, we have checked the speeds uh, our tankers and bulk carriers um, operated during 2019 and 2020. And we have seen that uh, these speeds were between 10 and 14 knots, or 35 and 55% of uh, um, main engine MCR. However, if we see that um, the attained EXI is, uh, exceeds the required value by 24%, um, which is not very uncommon even for vessels of 10 years old, we can see that the required DPA will be around 30%. And this 30% means that the new MCR of the engine will be decreased to 70% of the initial MCR, which is a, a significant decrease and may affect also significantly the maximum speed the vessel will be able, after the EPA, to deliver. Um, if we also consider that um, uh, the speed uh, under the speed declines, the speed performance declines as we get closer to the dry dock days, dates, uh, then we can realize, we have realized that this 30% power limitation is quite high. And let me give you a few examples. This is a Cape size biker built in 2011. This gray line is the Scandlin draft power speed line. This one is the, the speed at 75% of the existing MCR of the engine, 14 knots. This one is the new speed after the 30% speed limitation, uh, power limitation. Um, about half knot lower. And this one is the speed the vessel can uh, perform just before uh, the dry dog. These green dots are the speed values uh, of the last London voyage of this vessel before its dry dog. So this reduction of the speed is quite significant. As um, we approach the dry dock days, the vessel cannot give more than uh, 12 uh, point, uh, let's say, six knot speed. Another example of a VLCC tanker. Again, this, this vessel is only 10 years old and requires a 30% power limitation in order to meet the required EXI. The speed at the 75% of the existing MCR the new speed after the limitation, and the speed, the maximum speed that can be performed from the vessel right um, before the dry dock. And the Swiss Max Tanger, again, the same values, 75%. This one, this, is, this, this was the speed at the 75% of the MCR. This will be the new one. And this will be the, the, the speed that we are expecting the vessel to give before as it approaches its dry dock. So we understand that this, these new speeds are quite low and we may have implications to the commercial commitments of the vessel. So we have some concerns 
In case of a high-end power limitation, if this power limitation is above 30%, the examples I have show, show you uh, prove that uh, the NPL that will reduce the maximum engine power uh, below the 75% of the existing MCR must be carefully considered before applied, because even if it does not, this limitation affect the, the non-overpolation power range of the vessel may pose difficulties in ship's commercial obligations or may be proved a barrier in case the market conditions improve and require higher ship's speeds. Uh, many have expressed the opinion that the 30% EPA may become a measure of competitiveness after 2023. And according to others, a 30% EPA may provide assurance against future speed increases from the existing fleet helping in that way the owners to maintain the slow steaming practices. Which of the two opinions will prevail and will be proved uh, true depends on how many owners will decide to apply to their engines EPLs as high as 30% or more. From the IMO DCS data we know uh, the range our vessels operate we know the typical operating speed range of our vessel. We also know how often we need speeds above 30 knots, as an example, or as high as 40 knots or 15 knots. Therefore, by monitoring the power increase and the speed loss over time, we can be alerted when we approach the speed and the power limits imposed by the applied DPA. Um, so there is absolutely no doubt that after 2023, the management of speed and power will gain extra attention. And as a result, the necessity for accurate monitoring of the related performance indicators will encourage the use of high frequency data. And um, of course, digitalization. Also, the careful selection of antifouling coatings and the regular condition monitoring of Highland propeller, as always, are also expected to be used in a more systematic way in order the ship performance to be kept optimum within the new power ranges. The second measure of um, IMO is the carbon density index which is the operational measure proposed by IMO, which becomes uh, affected after 2025. Uh, the annual attained CII will be calculated by using the IMO DCS data, and then will be ver verified against the required value to determine the operational range of the vessel given on a scale from A to E. Um, I believe we already know that the vessels um, rated E or D for three consecutive years will be considered as underperformance and will have to develop an, a plan of corrective actions. And uh, for the moment, it seems there is no serious enforcement mechanism as yet, and such ships would continue to sail even if they are rated as D or E. And that, uh, furthermore, at this point in time, we are not aware of the possible consequences in case an underperforming vessel does not have a clear plan of corrective actions. IMO has not yet decided which, of the one, which one of the two indicators will be used for the CII calculations. Um, if it will be based on the actual cargo transported, which is the uh, Energy Efficiency Operational Index, uh, which is a better reflection of the carbon density because it uses the actual cargo transported. But the problem with the EOI is that the cargo is not in IMO DCS data. So it is not very easy to verify the EOI. And the next one is the annual um, efficiency ratio, which uh, uses the dead weight instead of the actual cargo, the vessel dead weight, which is a more straightforward uh, calculation. Let's see what we can do about the CII. From the IMO DCS data, we already have valuable information um, in order to see where we stand. All the voyage information are available. The indicators, if not already available, can be calculated by using the IMO DCS data. And the majority of companies so far, especially the 
the companies of uh, managing da- tankers and bulk carriers, uh, they do calculate and monitor the EOI and the AER, the annual efficiency rates of their field, uh, of their fleets, and uh, they have uh, uh, also put a target of a reduction, a percentage reduction of in an annual basis, on an annual basis. So we know, or we can calculate where our indicator stands. However, the compliance with the um, desired rating of uh, ABC um, is a more complex target because the CII is not only about the fuel consumption. Um, This is an operational indicator, and the operational performance of the vessel is greatly dependent on the commercial utilization of the vessel and on uh, not only the fuel consumption. It also depends on the weather conditions, the cargo type transfer, because not forget that in the tankers, especially some cargo, cargoes need heating and uh, as such uh, additional energy. The number of ballast voyages also is a factor that affects the operational performance of the vessel, the idle days, the port congestions, and many, many other factors that are beyond operator's control. So there is a higher difficulty to comply with the CII, especially if the company does not follow a proper performance monitoring policy. Um, Although the guidelines and the enforcement mechanisms are yet to be completed and no clear information is available about the consequences of no compliance, it appears that shipping companies must must, um, work towards a more um, robust policy on the monitoring uh, of fleet performance after 2023. And inevitably, this a performance monitoring policy must include the voyage planning based on the weather. Of course, the speed management, maybe the trim optimization, of course, the high and propeller condition and the use of um, advanced coatings, the low friction coatings. Um, the condition monitoring and proactive maintenance of fuel consumption control. And um, the last three uh, bullets, I have made them uh, bold because I believe they are the most important. Digitalization for accurate high, perfo- uh, high frequency information, artificial intelligence and machine learning for prediction and planning, technological innovation, and transparency and alignment with charters. Because this last one is, I believe it will become also quite important. The ship operators, um, have to ensure transparency and uh, close cooperation with uh, the charters if they want to um, comply effectively with the new CII ratings. Um, so ship operators anticipate an increase in demand from stakeholders to, get, to have accurate voyage data promptly available. With uh, this and other industry needs in mind, it would not be at all exaggerated to say that the performance-based policy will be, after 2023, the key instrument and critical success factor for a regulator compli- uh, regulatory compliance and increased market competitiveness. And in order to conclude, I would like to say that ships that do not achieve the required reduction in CO2 emissions will face uh, practical implications. And therefore, both EXI and CII will require technically efficient ships that operate in an increasingly efficient manner. So in the question uh, whether performance indicators uh, assist, uh, could assist on preparation and compliance with the IMO 2023 regulations, uh, the only answer ca- that we can give is that the performance indicator is already the game changer in the shipping industry, and there will be no other way to comply with these new regulations. And thank you very much for attending my presentation. Thank you, Maria. Yes, it's uh, 
EXI is a big headache uh, for all of us, <laughs> particularly given that uh, uh, there's still so much in the air, uh, still not so much finalized, and uh, whichever of you are managing LNG carriers, you'll also know how much of a, uh, of a gap there is with, with, with regards to what is achievable and what is, uh, anyway, big discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're, I will uh, hand over to Jakob, uh, from uh, who is a director of uh, Vessel Performance Solutions and uh, co-founder. The company was founded in 2014 and specializes in software products and consultancy services within performance management for the shipping industry. Jakob holds an MSc in Naval Architecture and a PhD for nonlinear strip theories for uh, ship response in waves from the Technical University of Denmark. He began his career with Force Technology, rising to the, to the position of Chief Specialist. Next assignment was as Chief Specialist and Head of the Vessel Performance Department within Maersk Maritime Technology for the AP Moller Maersk Group in Copenhagen. He successfully led the implementation and management of the Vessel Performance Management Service, focused on optimizing the operational performance of a large fleet. Later, he joined the, uh, he joined the American Bureau of Shipping as uh, Director of Energy Efficiency. He was responsible for the development and implementation of the classification uh, initiatives and uh, programs within performance management. Jakob brings more than 25 years of technical and operational expertise to uh, Vessel Performance Solution and has gained international recognition for his work on ship performance. So okay, over to you, Jakob. Yeah, okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, super, nice. Thank you for giving us this opportunity and uh, hello to everyone out there in the, uh, in the big, on the big internet. Uh, so uh, thank you, Maria, for that uh, very clear message uh, that came from you. And of course, uh, we as a, a service provider, of course, agrees fully with you. Uh, I think uh, this compliance thing with the CII will, will be the final step where every shipping company realizes that performance is actually something you have to take seriously. So it's, it shifts from being something you ought to do to something that you actually have to do. And that's going to be a, a game changer. I, I fully agree with that. So uh, I will present to you uh, our uh, ideas on, on how uh, a performance system uh, to, to comply with these things, but also to help you improve on your fleets will look like. Um, our company was based in 2014, uh, and we have this uh, web-based uh, service uh, we call Vespa that uh, help uh, our clients to save on the fuel bill, reduce CO2 emissions, and of course also document uh, compliance with, uh, with uh, IMO, DCS, and uh, um, uh, what is it called, EU MRV, and so on. Uh, and uh, since 2014, we have been uh, relatively successful. Uh, we are still an independent company. We have uh, now like 12 employees and five consultants, and uh, we have in our service now more than 1,000 vessels. Uh, and we cover both bulk carriers, tankers, containers, and railroad vessels. And on top of that, we also have among our clients, we have ship managers, we have ship owners that charter out vessels, and we also have ship operators uh, in our uh, portfolio. So our software is not dedicated to one of the three uh, segments, you could say. It actually just creates transparency on the performance uh, of your fleet, uh, no matter whether you are a ship manager or an owner or an operator. Uh, we will be starting a department in Athens in June uh, 2021, uh, believing that we can actually uh, increase our uh, volume uh, down in Athens, helping uh, the, some of the many shipping companies in, uh, in Greece. Uh, in, in any uh, performance system, uh, the, the core thing of uh, vessel performance is actually to be able to trend the performance of the vessel. Uh, and that's, of course, a key element uh, in Vespa as well. And uh, as everyone uh, in this, uh, among the speakers here all agree, we have to make uh, decisions based on data. And of course, how could you arrive? We like high quality data. Unfortunately, that's not always what we get. So we have to live with what we get. Uh, but we have tried to develop an application that, um, that can live with even poor data quality, so to say. But the trending is, uh, is essential. 
And uh, as you can see here, this is just an example from uh, one of our vessels. It's of course not the worst looking example that we have in our fleet uh, or in, in, in our portfolio. Uh, it's a good looking one, but the trending is of course important. And that is there to determine the efficiency of the hull and the propeller and the engine. Uh, and as you can see in the plot, our system is, is able to take uh, the, the classic moon reports. We take Autolog uh, data as well. It could come from Hopper, for example. Uh, and uh, then we take performance tests as well uh, as part of the way we analyze the data. The trending, the most important part of the trending is actually to uh, get to the, the real output of a performance system, which is the speed and consumption tables. And the speed and consumption tables are used in chartering, they are used in operations, they are used by ship managers, they are used to, to calculate business cases for various initiatives and so on, and they are the most important ones. And you can see an example of a speeding consumption table here, where we provide the, 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 the ton for 24 hours for different speeds and different drafts. We also provide the maximum uh, speed as well, as you can see. Uh, another important part is data quality, as Hauke mentioned, uh, also mentioned by NAPA, and uh, data quality is, of course, super uh, important. In, in VPS, uh, we don't do the data collection ourselves. We get the data from our clients, so we actually use the data that uh, people have. Uh, so we have interfaces to many, many, many different uh, new reporting systems and we have interfaces to many uh, also log data systems. Uh, so we just take the data. But in order to look at the data, we have to have a strong module that looks at the quality. So we have a very strong uh, data quality module uh, embedded in our software, and the client can follow the development of the quality, but you can also drill down and find the root causes of poor data quality, either new data or auto log data. The example you see in front of you here is uh, just an example from one of our clients that uh, after some time decided to actually do something about the quality of the data. Uh, and you can see that the error percentage uh, went down uh, after a dedicated effort uh, in this um, uh, and, and thereby you can control the quality of the data that you are receiving from, uh, from the fleet. Uh, another important part uh, which was also addressed uh, previously by, uh, by NAPA is the monitoring of uh, voyages uh, and, and whether vessels are com complying with the given charter party. And for that, we have both something we call the hard evaluation, which is actually a commodity, uh, checking the charter party against the rules of the charter party. But we also have something we call the soft evaluation, where we actually make a digital twin of the charter party, and thereby we are able to calculate actually for every new report irrespective of the speed or the draft or the instruction of the vessel, we are able to determine if there is an excess consumption compared to the digital twin of the charter party. A very, very strong uh, assessment here that can help on both sides of the fence, actually, to see whether my ship uh, meets, uh, meets the charter party or not. Uh, of course, uh, what Maria touched upon, the CII, uh, uh, is going to make a, a, a challenge for many shipping companies going forward. They have to be sure that their um, vessels comply with the new regulations. And uh, just like we have in, in the system, the EU MRV, and we have the IMO DCS uh, output reports for verification, uh, we, of course, also look into the future. Uh, and and uh, we have also started looking at CII. And this is just an example of a uh, an EUI calculation for a fleet since 2008. And we remember that all the reductions in principle have to be made uh, against the 2008 baseline. Uh, and we have shown here the, the development for a large fleet on both CII and EUI. And as Maria also indicated uh, or, or told us that the CII is different because it uses, uh, as it is today, it uses the capacity of the vessel, whereas the EUI uses the actual cargo carried. And you can see that even the reduction that we see for this fleet, the reduction rate is significantly different from the CII to the EUI. So this is just to demonstrate that we are on the forefront of this and we certainly intend to, uh, to help our clients all the way through these uh, uh, new regulations. 
Uh, then uh, as a, another uh, new, it's a rather new development that we have in our system. Uh, we have in our uh, in the project that I will mention in a few seconds, uh, we have developed a crew feedback module. Uh, so, of course, the crew is not responsible for holland propeller efficiency. Uh, that is the responsibility of the office and the ship management side. But they are responsible for their own uh, use of uh, electricity and, and power on board the vessel for, for vessel's own uh, purposes. And uh, the, the, also for the crew, it's important that they have a good understanding that the, the numbers that they are reporting to the office, uh, that they are important and going forward, we will see more and more transparency, and uh, we do believe that the, the, the old way of reporting that you just report to the charter party will not be uh, uh, sufficient in the future. So we have to uh, address the crews, and therefore we have developed the crew feedback module. One of the issues in the crew feedback module is, and not the issues, but the, the things that are available in the in the module is that you can look at it from the crew's perspective on a time basis. You can look at it on a voyage basis. You can see that on the on the part to the left. You can have different uh, dashboards that you can uh, show, and then you can show uh, things on a monthly basis, weekly basis, or quarterly basis. But the most important thing you see there is the one we show here that you are actually able to see how am I performing on my ship compared with the other vessels that I have been set up to be uh, compared to or competing with. And in that way, we hope to encourage the, the crews to actually improve, uh, you could say, more or less by themselves by having access uh, to the tool. That's uh, the idea. Then, uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, we have developed from uh, having projects together with clients. And uh, right now we are in a, in a large development, research and development project called uh, Shipping Lab in a work package called Digital Vessel Operation. And it's a project we are doing together with partners, which includes uh, the shipping companies Tom Lauritsen and Harvard Lloyd. And the main topics that we're working on in this project is, uh, first of all, digital twin. We want to improve the modeling of the ship, the ship's behavior at sea. We will look more into voyages, uh, optimization, yield optimization, uh, monitoring of the voyage, uh, controlling that everything is according to plan. And if it's not according to plan, we will uh, put up with the right alarms. We are working on advanced diagnostics because uh, you could say one thing is that a performance system tells you that something is wrong, but what the crew needs, what the ship manager needs, uh, what the owner needs is actually the conclusion on top of that, what do I need to do with this ship or with this problem? That's the kind of diagnostics uh, we are working on to, uh, to develop. And we are not using AI for that, Maria. We are using something I call HI. And the HI is called, uh, or it stands for human intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah, then we are working on the crew feedback module that is, uh, of course, uh, which I just showed to you. And it's a three and a half years project, and there's like 16,000 hours of development of uh, R&D, and that's for, from our side. Uh, and we are very proud to be part of that. And as a final remark, I would like to say that we have a cooperation and, and interfacing with Weather News so that we have uh, the, this is the true essence of Internet of Things and APIs and uh, interfacing. So, so we have uh, an automatic interface to WNI and uh, we can also interface to other weather routing companies if, if that is uh, required. And I think uh, that uh, concludes my presentation. So uh, yeah, you are of course very welcome to contact us if you are interested to hear more about this. We are very eager to demonstrate this to, uh, to people who would like to know about this. And uh, with that, I would like to say thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much, uh, Jakob. I actually have a question, uh, but I'll have to leave it for the end uh, because we're a little bit uh, behind. That's okay. Uh, so uh, I would like to um, then uh, hand over to Gregos, who is uh, Dorian's fleet performance manager, uh, working in uh, from uh, the Copenhagen office. He has been uh, uh, managing performance initiatives for 22 Dorian-owned ships. His passion is modern data storage integration analytics technologies with data visualization techniques to understand underlying processes and leverage decision-making. 
he went through IT development to a long C going career, uh, fuel performance coaching and IT project management to bind it all together for Dorian fleet performance. Uh, Jakob, ah, okay. Okay, I think that's me. Can you hear me well, Frank? Yeah, I can hear you, but we, we're still, we can just see us so far. I'm not seeing a presentation. Okay. I, I was uh, okay. uh, All right, can you see this one? Uh, not yet. I may come up. I, I hadn't uh, stopped sharing. <clears throat> Coming up now. Maria, you also forgot to mute. I think I have some problem with the connectivity. Sorry for that. If uh, if I'm going off, that's uh, Frank. You, you're gonna tell me. Uh, so far, I switch off my video and. Yes, for sure. Now you can see me, yeah. Yeah, now we can see. Yeah, we can see a compass. Okay, <laughs> all right, it's turning. A technical technical remark: you can enlarge your screen if you if you hover over the screen and and go to the upper corner, the the, the right upper corner. You can make it full screen. It's probably will be much better to uh, to see this full screen than than on the small one. And I will do the same. I have 15 minutes, and I will tell the story about the Dorian fleet performance from the owner's perspective. And that's very important because we uh, we may tell the story about the performance, how we are doing it so far, but that's not right or wrong, or uh, probably there are many other ways to do the performance, the fleet performance. That's just our Dorian way uh, uh, to deliver the, the, the better transportation technique and travel free transportation. That's what is our mission. We are taking our mission very, uh, very seriously. And to safe, reliably clean and tra travel-free transportation is something what we have to live, live with and we want to deliver. And to deliver it, uh, it needs a change. And that's why the Dorian is changing right by, right now for through the digitalization. So I, I have to tell the story also about the company, who we are and what we are doing. Uh, we are operating the vessel from 1973. And it was we are starting from tankers, general cargo, and bar carriers. And then from 2003, we have uh, we have a Dorian LPG. We are operating right now 22 very large gas, gas carriers, and we have in-house commercial and technical services. We are operating our vessels uh, from many locations right now. We have a we have a headquarter in Stanford in Connecticut. Uh, all our technical uh, Crewing, purchasing, marine uh, departments allocated in Athens. We have a really good group of op vessel operators in London, and uh, last not least, we have uh, charterers in in Copenhagen. And uh, me and Peter Hatzpateras, we are forming the fleet performance, and we are sitting with charterers in Copenhagen as well. I have to mention one very important thing that uh, we are part of, uh, we are co-partners with Phoenix Tankers and we are forming all together the Helios LPG pool. And together we are operating 33 uh, very large gas carriers. And we have also the office, uh, uh, Phoenix Tankers office we have in Singapore and we have also the operators uh, uh, there uh, doing the, 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 the pool partners vessels as well. It's very important because of the IT and all the uh, connections or all the way we have to do the performance later. So our vessels, our vessels, uh, you can see them on the screen right now. They are, we have three little bit older VLGCs that are built in, in to, between 2006 and 2008. And we have 19 uh, new vessels, relatively new vessels built between 2014 and 2015. We call them Echo Fleet because they have this new uh, uh, MNA BMW G type long stroke engines uh, with optimized design and efficient cooling plants. 
that's important for us going forward because that's a good starter for us because they are low in EXI, uh, low in EDI, which will be based like the EXI calculation later on. So it's a good starter for 2023, and we hope we can we can deliver a good performance out of them. If we are talking about uh, uh, our vessels, I have to mention also the, the triangle. This is our consumption triangle, and this is also very important for us because that's also the, the, uh, our effort triangle, I would say. If uh, we have about 80% of our consumption is main engine, it's like 78%, we have 20% of uh, uh, consumption on the auxiliaries because we have also the big compressor cooling plants and only 2% on the boilers, which boilers are pra practically domestic use. We are not using the boiler for, the, for any, any, any cargo operation. And this triangle is also our effort, our performance effort, which we are giving to, to, uh, to the performance from the last year. And mostly we are concentrating on the, on the main engine hull and the propeller performance. And that's obvious because that's low hanging fruit for us to deliver the better performance as we are. So what it is right now, when I try to prepare to this presentation, we went through kind of process we try to establish uh, how data are flowing within the, the Dorian and what we need to deliver the, 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 the fleet performance. If you ask me the fleet performance is IT or, or, or another architecture, I would say somewhere between, because you need a very strong IT infrastructure to deliver the performance on the end. And that's actually what we are doing in Dorian right now. We are trying to prepare ourselves to 2023 with all the IT infrastructure connections, core, core calculations to be able to, uh, to deliver well, well performance before we start the IMO, IMO changes. So what we have over here, we have a multi-point multi -point structure. We are coming from the measuring equipment. Uh, we, are, we have uh, we are using the, the, the hybrid system, I would say. We have a manual reporting together with the new vessel has the autolog system. Then we have the, we are preparing to the data lake where we can store all the, all the gathered data. We are processing it through the validation models and filtration to the core calculations. I will talk about it. We have a BI system to, uh, to make ad hoc visualization and analytics. And then we can present it in the different way for, for cleaning, uh, uh, return of investment, KPIs, adjustment, pull points, anti-falling anti -falling program, everything what we, what we need. That's, that's our basic flow and, and we are doing it uh, uh, right now. Similarly, the same flow, if we want to deliver the proper EXI and CII on the, in the next two years, we will have the same data, the same data to be able to predict and to pre-calculate the, the, uh, the indexes in the future. For us and for you, definitely not like that, that you will find out on the end of the year on the, uh, that, that you are exceeding the CII, for example, or you're go going out of the, of, the, uh, of, of the values of the limits. We want to predict it well, at, well in advance. We want to know well ahead that we are going off and we will have to change the operational pattern accordingly to adjust to it. Performance indicator are very important for us. I'm dividing it to both uh, to, to, to key performance indicator, which belongs to the high level, to the management level, I would say. And we have the, the standard performance indicator, which belongs to the, to the low level, to us, to the crew, and, and, uh, and uh, everybody who is working with the performance. And we are delivering it through this process as well. There is the calculation methodology with the same process. Of course, the EXI and uh, EXI is something on the border between the fleet performance and the technical. And I would say it belongs very much to the technical, uh, uh, to the technical delivery because it's about the machinery and the changing the, the consumption and emissions. And we are co cooperating with our technical department. We are rather on the data side and on the, on the, on the prediction side. So together with the data, we are trying to establish which uh, what deliver better better results on the end so far we have no one solution which will give us the, the good uh, 
the good result that probably will finish on multiple solutions to to improve our exi or reduce the the, the edi even further last probably not least as our uh, ci it's uh, de delivered with the same with the same uh, structure we don't know yet what the cii will be uh, maria was talking about it in, in in length i will not i will not go go here we are just we are just uh, trying to to establish the the data which we need and we are let's say we have a playground for that we are trying to pre-calculate it and see what different scenario operational pattern will give us an improvement on CII and what is the best to, to deliver better, better performance. As you see over here, there is one common denominator on all, everything what we are doing that's a really strong core. And the strong core is something we are working right now. We want to exceed it. We want to work on the better data lake transmission APIs and all the connections, connectivity. And that's that's something what we have to deliver. We will have to be ready in the next coming year to uh, to, to, to have the proper proper data infrastructure to, to, to deliver the, the analytics and, and calculations. There is one thing we, we, ha we have already. You, you had the Jacob just before. Our core analytics and our core calculations are derived from vessel performance solution. We have already uh, we have already the data connections to, to the to the to the VPS, and we are already using the VPS for for our hull cleaning program for delivering all the data for connecting from one side to our data for the other side to connecting through the API to our BI system, and that's that's excellent system to to deliver through the through the API and we have it already. We have the on the manual data we are we are using the uh, the, the vessel. Uh, IMOS platform, and we are using the same operational VESON NUN reports as a, as a manual feed also to the VPS. We have also on board the vessels, we have the, the KGIF, KGIF data, and we are in the process also to extending it and on to using data lock or, uh, or automatic data collection system. We are feeding it already to, to vessel performance solution. We have a test with three vessels. I can show it uh, shortly that we have a really good results about it. And of course, we have our, uh, uh, our BI system uh, and BI tools. We are using the Tableau to extend our visualization and to calculate something what we cannot get from the other, uh, uh, other system. And it will always be kind of ad hoc, ad hoc calculations which you need to deliver. There always will be this kind of management uh, question uh, uh, how it's uh, how it looks something what you don't have yet calculated that's why we for us the, the the using the bi system is very important and that's what we are doing now the kpi i think it's sometimes it's really forgotten we are talking about a, a lot about autolog data and the, and the quality and we have it of course and we want to deliver it but if you have the the, the pool systems like like we are operating and you have a different technology on the vessels and you have a new vessel mixed up with a little bit older one or the vessel which belongs to you or and the vessel which not belongs to you from the technical perspective it's very difficult to get this common common reporting platform and that's why our common reporting platform is actually manual data reporting we can enrich it with the with the autolog data whenever we have but the common reporting platform is still manual reporting and that's why for us data reporting and managing the change in the data reporting is truly important and i think if we are talking in the, in the, uh, about the performance indicators and putting the performance indicators on board for the crew it's very important for us to say that before we do the pe performance indicator and before we do the force the people to uh, uh, to indicate them how good they are in the reporting we have to go through the change model and that's what we are doing right now we are extending awareness, desire, and knowledge. From one year uh, uh, right now, we are working with the crew, and this is the, the hard work with the crew uh, through the meetings, online meetings, through the uh, pre-embarkation meeting, through the seminars uh, also. We are trying to pitch the performance to our crew on board that they have the understanding and the awareness of the process. It's truly important for us to uh, 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 this, kind of, this kind of management change because that's the people on board are doing the performance for us and they have to know what, 
what we are doing and how we are doing. One of the things we did also the last year, we did the manual. It's a very detailed manual for the crew. And, uh, and uh, we went the, the, the long by del delivering it. They have it. They have it on board. And we, when, when we describe uh, piece by piece how the reporting should be, how we are calculating the performance, what is important for us, and, uh, uh, and, and how we are doing it really. We think that without this, this detailed performance description, it's very difficult for crew to understand why the people ashore need the data and what the quality means for us and what the quality means for the people on board. So we have it. It's very detailed. I would not show it right now. It's, uh, it, it's available. And, and that's what we are sharing with the crew all the time. And that's how we are pitching also our, our initiatives on board. And that's what we can see from the last year. We introduced the system in, in, in the, in, on the beginning of 2020 together with the Vesper, together with the Vessel Performance Solution with the Vesper. And that's actually the feed from the, from the, our uh, validation, validation engine. In the moment, we, it was March 2020, we, we kind of introduced the new reporting system, introduced the, the, the manuals. We, we build the awareness in the crew why we need the performance and what does mean the quality of the reported data for us. We, we could observe the, the huge drop in the, in the uh, uh, huge increase in the quality data and huge drop in the error level. And you can see, see we reduced the error level in our manual reporting system by half, only by the by the management change uh, within the crew, by kind of better better reporting system, by understanding by crew understanding why we need it and what for we are using it, and that's we are proud of really, and that's that's kind of our achievement, uh, and and this is really good. So, Jacob was showing it a few minutes ago. We will have the onboard module also from the Vesper. We will we will share it with the crew. And that's probably also the moment we will introduce the, the, the performance indicators also on them, because in that moment also they, they, they have this awareness, they, they, they have the knowledge how to, how to report. So we will be able also to introduce a little bit stronger performance indicators on board the vessels to also monitor how they, uh, how they improve further. Saying all of that, if we are talking about the data and, uh, and fleet performance manager uh, role and, and so on, that's actually, uh, I was thinking what to show for you and, and, and I come up with, with a day from the performance manager life. I want to show you what I'm looking at. And that's kind of, uh, uh, that's kind of structure uh, uh, every day I'm doing. And when I'm starting my day, my day there is a part of this, which is, which is kind of a, a starter for me. And I want to share it with you, how, how we are doing the performance in Dorian. So first of all, we are checking the, the, the quality of the data. And apart, as, as, as far as we can see, the, the, some of the autolog data, it's very important for us to know if the vessels are reporting or not reporting. And that's actually, it's delivered through the, through the Tableau. And we can see how many reports we have every day, what the vessels are doing. If we have all the reports, if something is missing, if any vessel is lagging. And this is kind of starter for us for the, for the next, next uh, next round. The second thing is what we are doing. It's always the validations. That means we are using the Vesper, Vesper system to, to check how the, how the validations looks out, how many errors we have. And when we see some, some prolonging errors or, or something what's going wrong on board the vessels, we are contacting the crew. We are trying to establish why we, are, we, are, we have the errors, what's happening, and if there's something we miss in the manual. Or there is something the knowledge they miss, and we have to we have to improve it. Probably the third third thing, and actually I love this view as a as a as a performance manager. That's the our fleet overview from the from the Vesper. It shows me actually which vessels uh, perform per, perform well and which vessels are outlier. And it's very important for me to not look at each vessel uh, at each vessel one by one. It's actually to find the vessel which are outliers. And to work on the outliers first of all, because that's the vessels which, which needs my attention as a fleet performance manager. And this fleet performance overview is kind of a basic view from the from the Vesper, and I truly love it. And I think it's very well developed, showing me all I need on the beginning of my day. 
if I see that something is wrong with my vessel, I'm usually switching to the, uh, uh, to the vessel performance trend. And uh, it, Jacob was showing it also. It's a very detailed view how the vessel day by day reporting looks like in the system. This is actually the vessel when you can see the overlaying the, the auto log data over the manual data. When you when you look on the on the right side, you can see those dots uh, and, and squares with with the with, with the with the dot in the middle. That's actually both manual data and the uh, and the auto log data in the same view. I have to say that there is no big difference. I cannot see the big difference in the in the, in the in the in this accurate in this in this uh, in, for this vessel. We are more or less good in the in the manual data, which is which is proof with the with the stable period from the from the Vesper calculation. That's the really good symptom for us uh, for using the, the, the manual data uh, for the vessels which we don't have the, the outlook. And I go further. The next step I'm doing usually that's the main engine performance. Of course, I'm looking how my main engine performing. Auxiliaries, of course, I'm looking in the auxiliaries on the base load where I am if, if, if there's any problems in, in, the, in the auxiliaries consumption. Last not least, that's my dashboard, which I usually keep on my on my one on, on my screen the whole day, which showing me the, the overview of my fleet and, and the changes in the in the performance. I like the dashboard very much. It's a, it's, it gives me kind of a quick feedback whenever something is wrong and something is off. It also give me the, my outliers. That means the vessel which showing me some problems, so I can I can focus my my attention to this on only these vessels, not looking in another which which don't need my attention. So what else I'm doing during my day? <laughs> Probably that's something what uh, uh, what I'm doing after checking on all my all my vessels. Usually we are we are working on the kind of uh, uh, views for the management, and this was one of the things which we were we doing the, the last year. We went we, we had a, the very strong hull cleaning propeller polishing program, and one of the management question was uh, actually, "Hey Greg." You did. You spend a lot of money on the cleaning and all of that. Uh, how much we earned? <laughs> and that's a good question because uh, the, the uh, return of investment uh, questions are the basic question on the man management level. And having the data from the Vesper, being able to uh, uh, to push it out from the from the EPI or from the database to the to the Tableau, we were able to calculate the the, the profits, and that's the profit calculation for us from the last year. Just to tell you, from the last year, for only our vessels, we were able to save like 4,700 metric tons of fuel, which is a good result for for, uh, uh, for for our fleet. But I have to say, it was very very uh, very dynamic, very dynamic hull cleaning program, and we were uh, we were overlooking the the hull performance very closely last year. Uh, what else Gregor, we are doing? We are sorry, doing Gregor, also, uh, I Sorry, Gregor, uh, I have to ask you to speed up a little bit because we are now actually eating yeah. into our Q&A time and Aaron has still not presented, so. Yeah, I'm finishing it, all right. Guys, I, we are doing a lot of, that's, that's something what, what, what we are using, including the, 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 the prediction on EI. I think that's, all that says, that's our Dorian way. That's how we are delivering the performance and that's how we are going to deliver it in the future. Thanks a lot, Frank, that's all, all yours. Thank you, not all mine, uh, all Aaron's actually, but thank you very much for that, Gregor. That was uh, very interesting and uh, quite uh, quite unusual structure of presentation. I enjoyed it very much. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Aaron Holton, who is the president and CEO of uh, Trust Solution. Aaron has been focused on executing the growth strategy of Tress while supporting customer success, product strategy, marketing, and business development efforts, among others. He was formerly a management consultant for Charles River Associates and PacWest Consultant Partners, where he advised public and private sector organizations on a range of uh, strategic issues. He delivered projects in the areas of strategy analysis and formation, big data and advanced analytics, operations and implementation, procurement supply chain strategy, organizational development, and commercial uh, financial due diligence. Aaron has uh, authored uh, numerous articles on performance strategies and the importance of data centralization analytics to improve business operations and support ESG initiatives. 
He has also spoken in various industry forums on the importance of data validation and quality for verification. He holds a bachelor's degree in finance from the University of Texas at Austin. Okay, so uh, while uh, Aaron is sorting out uh, this problem, uh, I would uh, like to ask the question I had from, uh, from before for Jakob, actually. Jakob, can you hear me? I hear you loud and clear, and now okay. I'm unmuted. Perfect. Perfect. You don't, you don't have a headset, and I therefore uh, could not no, tell. No. So, um, how do you ensure operational data quality, and especially if the data is coming from sensors? This has been a big topic of discussion today, so we would like yeah. to hear your thoughts on yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, data quality, no matter whether it comes from noon data or whether it comes from automated uh, sensors, uh, uh, one of the key issues is, of course, the um, the sensor itself. Uh, is it properly calibrated? Because we get, uh, let, let's take the simple thing of an uncalibrated torsion meter, whether the crew reads the number and puts it in the knee report or whether it comes from sensor data, the result is the same. It's it's a wrong value that you get to the office. So this module I talked about, the uh, the uh, uh, operational data quality module, it checks all the different parameters of every uh, sensor signal we get, noon, outer lock, uh, and it checks uh, for validity, range checks, um, uh, and, and plausibility checks, and comes up with warnings uh, for every, you could say, a data set that we receive. So, so basically with the module, you will be able to automatically, uh, let's say you have an outer lock campaign on, on 35 vessels, just to take Maria's uh, example. Uh, if they were delivering data into the system, you would automatically on a daily basis uh, be able to see whether all the sensors were delivering uh, values within these plausible uh, ranges. Another way of looking at it is, of course, if you dig a bit deeper, is to go in and look at trending. Uh, so trending of speed locks, uh, trending of uh, torsion meters, tension of uh, trending of uh, SFOCs, and so on, will also help you uh, find out whether uh, your outer lock campaign uh, delivers plausible uh, results. So as I understand it from uh, what we heard from Opel, they, they uh, they put a lot of value uh, or a lot of uh, emphasis on checking the data on board the vessels. And I'm pretty sure that some of the items that I already mentioned here that we do in, uh, in our software, that is already uh, done on the, on the hopper side uh, on board the vessels. Some of that, but maybe not all of that. Uh, I think with the modeling of the ship and our performance uh, angle to things, uh, I think we are able to maybe get one step further than that and thereby see through uh, poor data quality. So that's how we try to, uh, to to handle that situation. And we do get outer lock data from many different systems. And uh, the outer lock system itself is not always the issue. It's more uh, are the sensors delivering. That, that's the, the, the key here is uh, sensor reliability, I would say. Yeah, actually, Jakob, I can uh, confirm from our own experience. Uh, we have uh, telemetry uh, systems on uh, approximately 50 ships uh, fully integrated with uh, our, our ERP system, PAL, that I mentioned before. And we do see that uh, actually it doesn't have anything to do with uh, uh, the, ven the sensor vendors or even the, the telemetry vendor or anything like that. Sensors do fail. Mm -hmm. uh, there is drift, and it's extremely interesting to see the the various uh, initiatives described by all the co-speakers here, um, with uh, with regards to how to track sensor packages. I mean, we we saw uh, sorry signal packages. We saw sometimes uh, signal packages coming and actually being empty. So we've we've gone down to the level of uh, uh, checking each of the sensor signals. Uh, within validation ranges and uh, plausibility checks, as you said, you know, cannot have negative values and what have you. And I, so I, to this regard, how can I really did find interesting your approach to correlation uh, checks for for the signals? Um, yeah, love but, to... but, yeah but, but, but I think the, the way the way forward there is the, the physical modeling. So it's, it's like, uh, 
like it is with, with when we do the trending, uh, we have an expected performance uh, of the vessel in that weather condition and for that speed and for that draft. Uh, but it's the same with the sensor signals. You have to have uh, a physical modeling behind it and then have expected values. And then when you see uh, a drift in the uh, a difference between the expected value and the actual value, uh, then you have to uh, come up with alarm. So I, I believe uh, in, uh, I, as I said, I don't believe in artificial intelligence. I believe in human intelligence. We believe in modeling, modeling the physics uh, and understanding what's going on. That's the way forward. And you need to compare the signals with the expected values. Uh, one of the things that we are working on uh, in our shipping that project is uh, actually to enhance our uh, uh, monitoring side to not look well, right now, everybody or a lot of people, they are looking at performance from speed and uh, consumption-wise or speed power. But we will also include uh, power RPM and we will also include uh, RPM speed uh, so that in reality, we will have three different models up and running at the same time. And with that, we actually hope to be able to uh, tell exactly uh, not only which sensor is wrong, but maybe even be able to tell how much that sensor needs to be calibrated. That's the way we are moving forward. But we are not there now. But that's now. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Jacob. In the meantime, Aaron seems to have uh, uh, managed to, to sort out his technical difficulties. Uh, Aaron, can you... Uh, uh, yep, can you hear me okay now? And can you see my yeah, screen? Yeah, we can. Uh, okay. Okay, perfect. Yep, sorry about that, everyone. I, um, internet connection timed out at the absolute worst time. So uh, we'll try to kind of speed through this uh, a little bit. So today I wanted to talk about kind of controlling the controllables. Um, kind of our mantra and our focus is always with, with our customers, kind of as, as advisors and partners is always, there's a lot happening within the industry, a lot that you can kind of tie your time and your resources into. And so when it comes to the unique resources of every ship owner, technical manager, or, or charter, really kind of boiling it down to the, the basic steps that you can take to kind of have an impact today. Um, the, the presentation is a little bit new. So last week we were at Trace Solutions. We were acquired by Navtor, a um, very well-known e-navigation leader. Um, they launched in, in 2011, providing e-navigation solutions and, and really as a total supplier of navigational products and services for the maritime sector. In 2012, they released the world's first type approved pay as you sail ENC service. And in 2014, launched NavStation. Uh, more recently, um, as of kind of the beginning of February, they also launched NavFleet, which is um, the, the vision there is to become a total ship operations platform covering everything from navigational planning to vessel performance and um, over time, many other kind of core capabilities related to um, kind of ship operations. They have nearly 7,000 ships using their products and services today. Trace, uh, we founded the company in 2016. Um, really the, the vision there was to provide a comprehensive suite of, of vessel performance solutions at the end of the day, focused on helping improve operational and fleet efficiency, which then has the, the net impact of saving money and, and also reducing emissions. We serve over th uh, 300 vessels today comprised of ship owners, technical managers, and charterers. And we have uh, uh, teams focused um, or based in Houston, Copenhagen, Hamburg, and, and Mumbai. When It's kind of hard to ignore that when you scan headlines from any major kind of industry media outlet, the, the focus or the, the news is very similar, we kind of ran an informal scan um, a few weeks ago and at least 20% of the, the headlines across I think four or five major news outlets were about regulations, technologies, alternative fuels, or other initiative, initiatives that could reduce emissions from, sh from shipping. Um, as we've progressed throughout 2019, 2020, and today, the narrative is only growing louder and it's coming from all corners and different stakeholders. So there are governments who are obviously trying to quantify the impact of emissions um, and setting reduction targets as well as high level strategies to achieve this. We, of course, have the regulators, um, IMO included, that are working um, with governments to implement rules that would reduce emissions from ships. And I think um, our fellow panelists described a lot of those initiatives very well, many well-defined, some still being defined. 
But at the end of the day, um, there are a number of evolving rules and regulations that um, shipping companies and, and the, the various industry stakeholders are being um, asked to abide by. And, and of course, we're seeing increasing presence and in, in financial institutions, not only from an investor point of view for, for publicly traded owners, but also banks, et cetera, that are starting to ask tougher questions as it relates to ESG strategies in general. Um, and so uh, lenders are joining forces. Of course, frameworks like the Poseidon principles are establishing mechanisms to align lending portfolios to, clim to climate targets. And so I, I read something the other day that the number of signatories to the Poseidon principles will number, number 23, or, or maybe it already has. And this equates to approximately 50% of all debt extended to shipping. So of course, as governments, regulators, and financial institutions are becoming more and more involved and in increasing their level of scrutiny on the industry, shipping companies are, are of course asked and expected to act and respond. And so we see a lot of proactive from our own clients, uh, as well as just the industry at large, um, even listening to kind of uh, um, what Maria was talking about and then for, from the Dorian side, what they're focused on. So companies are taking proactive steps to start to comply and even to, um, I guess, provide valuable inputs to the regulation. So uh, you see the presence and emergence of frameworks that enable cargo owners to align their activities with responsible environmental behavior, i.e. the sea cargo charter. You see a lot of investment and a lot of these headlines and, and kind of research and development on alternative fuels and other ship designs and technologies. Many of those are being also led by notable ship owners. So again, Many are contributing to the solution. Larger players with the resources are support, supporting a lot of these R&D efforts, and, and many are willing signatories um, to a lot of the, the different frameworks that I mentioned. However, that's not always the case. What, what we've seen with some of our customers is you have many kind of smaller to medium-sized ship owners that often kind of, whether it's um, in public eye or behind closed doors, are often um, hesitant or worried about what this can mean for them. Obviously, with regulation and compliance comes added cost. And so a lot of times it's easy to get bogged down into what does this mean for me and how can I um, kind of manage in either not wanting to do enough or wanting to do or needing to do feeling the need to do too much. So again, the kind of theme of the presentation and what we talk with our customers about is controlling the controllable to do it, what you can with what you have where you are. So we focus on those things that our customers that they can that, that are more within their control. So the kind of questions we ask is, what does your fleet renewal strategy look like? Are you making kind of um, sound whole coating decisions that that can help reduce uh, consumption from your vessels? Are you installing the right types of energy saving devices? Um, do you have systems in place to um, fulfill basic compliance needs around EUMRV, IMO, DCS, and do you have a sound vessel performance strategy? If you think about it, the possibilities, uh, I think um, it's easy to say, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm concerned about another, yet yeah, another expense, all for the sake of compliance. But think about the potential of a, a modest vessel performance strategy. Um, we took one customer with a, about 36 tankers, um, consuming about 350,000 tons of fuel per year, emitting roughly 1.1 million tons of CO2 with a fuel bill of approximately $123 million and said to them, what if we could just um, help drive 1% improvement? What would that mean to you? Um, and, and clearly you can see here that the savings potential is enormous and, and there aren't, it's not um, necessarily a, a tough ask to be able to drive something like this. In many cases, we see quite a bit more. Um, our core platform is known as Trust Vessel Analytics, TVA. So we take a very flexible approach with our customers to help identify opportunities for uh, performance improvement. So um, the, the the modeling concept and kind of the digital twin concept that, that Frank and Jakob talked about is very similar to what we're doing today. So we take a vessel specific approach to how we model out behavior of the vessels. And then for us, um, maintaining flexibility is, is kind of always a, a big thing that we're focused on. So from a noon reporting perspective, we have the ability to capture either manual or automated data. Um, and then again, data validation being key, our dual layer validation approach, which is having um, several hundred uh, validations on, on 
on the vessel uh, or within the software that can provide that first layer of data quality. And again, this is based on the particulars of each vessel. It's how those validation algorithms are put in place. And then a second layer review once the data comes to shore by an experienced shore team. And these are all uh, marine engineers, naval architects that have spent years sailing and also um, significant time ashore for very large ship owners on their performance teams. Um, and then at the end of the day, once you have good data, then it's a matter of arming your customers with the right level of analytics that can help them actually make better decisions, um, not only for the purpose of improving effic operational efficiency, making their vessels more competitive, but again, also reducing um, kind of fuel consumption. And then at the end of the day, that has a, the, the benefit of environmental savings as well. We leverage a series of kind of decision support tools to drive these benefits. As I mentioned, report monitoring is a big part of what we do. So this dual layer validation system are, is critical to establishing a high level of data quality. And then um, our analytics cover everything from fleet performance to ongoing and historic voyage analysis, making sure that there's C um, ongoing CP monitoring and compliance, as well as kind of bunker planning, fuel tables, and, and, and our emissions module in general, is not only meant to help with compliance with EUMRV, IMO DCS, but also to help monitor emissions, um, whether that be CO2, NOx, SOx, particulate matter, um, methane, halo carbon emissions, um, as well as some of the key metrics such as EOI and AER as well. And then providing decision support for our customers. So whether that um, is whole performance monitoring, main engine, auxiliary engine performance, trim, optimization, um, looking at CLO consumption or port optimization. Um, it's again, not every customer has the same types of needs. Um, the priorities may be different. So it's a matter of understanding those priorities and then um, being able to, to offer solutions and modules that will address those pain points. Um, as Gregor said, whole performance uh, and kind of main engine performance, those are low hanging fruits that we see in a lot of organizations. And I think in a Dorian case with 78% of total consumption going to these areas, you can see the benefits of having uh, high quality data collection and then analytics um, and a targeted strategy focused on improving those things. And then at the end of the day, it's great to have data collection tools. It's great to have um, analytics at your fingertips, but it's, it's about measuring and quantifying the impact. So there was a, a great slide about showing the benefits of, of whole cleaning from a dollars and cents perspective. Uh, one of the things that we've been more focused on over the last year is a lot of our customers who are publicly traded ship owners are producing ESG reports or in their investor presentations. Not only want to talk about their efficiency programs that are in place, but again, with the attention coming from the shipping community on emissions, it's also being able to talk more about improvements in other areas. So looking at EOI improvements and AER improvements. And so uh, with our approach, what we do is not only kind of, again, provide the intelligence and analytics to help drive those decisions, but we sit down with our customers and talk about what tactics do we focus on that will then drive that. And so in the example of this customer is a notable tanker owner. And over a three year period from kind of mid 2017 to 2020, we were able to improve EOI by 12%, which had a tangible impact on not only fuel consumption, um, kind of in the the tune to the tune of, of 65,000 metric tons of fuel, but also around 22 to 23 million dollars of savings over that period, and and that was by focusing on kind of implementing a proactive full and. Okay, looks like Aaron has frozen. Propeller. Okay, looks like Aaron dropped, unfortunately. He, he had a short comeback, very short. Uh, very unfair to him. He was in full role now. Quite difficult. I think I'm done. 
Uh, Aaron, we can. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> that must have killed you. <laughs> That, that, that was like at the Oscars where they start playing the music and say, get you off the stage. <laughs> Frank, are you muted? I think the, I can't. I just wanted to ask whether you have uh, something to, to wrap your presentation up with, uh, or you actually meant that you're, you're done. No, I, the uh, system cut off my screen sharing and I heard an audio saying your, your uh, screen sharing is now complete. And so I think the timeout, uh, it timed me out. So I, I guess the, the, the summary is um, kind of focus on what you can control today and, and appreciate everyone's uh, time and, and listening in. Uh. Thank you, Aaron. Actually, we, we have uh, decided internally to extend the um, the presentation uh, for another nine minutes. So, if you feel, uh, if you want to wrap up uh, with uh, the end of your presentation, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, we have to fill up with uh, some Q and A. Yeah, no, I think I think that kind of the the last slide that I had was was again, it's easy to kind of focus on the the headline grabbing efforts around R and D, um, but not every company has the resources to control or participate in, in these types of work. So a targeted performance strategy um, can help at a minimum with regulatory compliance, but if implemented correctly, can certainly drive cost savings and other environmental benefits. And so all good performance strategies start with data. And so making sure you have an adequate solution in place to get it right, because as we know, the mantra garbage in, garbage out certainly holds true. And so with good data, having robust analytics at your disposal can not only kind of help close the performance gap, but also um, if it aids in your decision making, then then you're better off for it. And, and of course, um, if you're not measuring results and consistently looking for that kind of impact and benefit, then it's difficult to be able to know whether your your strategy is sound. So that, that concludes my presentation and, and certainly appreciate uh, everyone listening in. Thank you, Aaron. I mean, uh, we we briefly talked about this before, uh, about a month ago or so, of course, but it's always uh, extremely uh, nice to see the the approach of uh, uh, validation uh, based on digital twin from the vessel reporting side, which is something that we, we have also adopted. Uh, it's extremely tricky to enforce and very difficult to maintain, of course, but uh, then again, uh, you're catching uh, bad data at the time of creation, right? So, uh, of course, you you increase the amount of data you, that you ultimately have to uh, analyze and uh, rely on. Um, so, uh, any questions to Aaron's presentation? Um, are many of the speakers? Okay, um, just need to check whether we have any open questions from the audience. Can I um, ask uh, Jacob something about uh, his presentation? Hey, Jacob, you talking about the human intelligence, and I would like you to define how how you define uh, your efforts on the human intelligence because I believe it's more challenging than. The artificial intelligence—it <laughs> is much more difficult. I tend to Where? disagree. I, I tend to disagree. Well, I, I have been using uh, artificial intelligence also uh, in in the past. Uh, or you, well, in my case, I was using uh, neural networks. Uh, and and if the if if there is some kind of systematic behavior in data then artificial intelligence can find the way through the data. Uh, but if the data is full of, uh, you could say, drifting sensors, uh, wave heights that are not exactly correct, uh, um, yeah, all, all these problems that we see with all the data we get, I, I, I have problems seeing, I can simply not understand how artificial intelligence can see through all the data. I agree. I agree. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's a... It's a matter of if you have good data and you have billions of data sets that covers everything, well, then maybe artificial intelligence can do it. But I believe that with proper physical, mathematical 
uh, modeling of the ship's behavior with the knowledge we have uh, from university and then use it properly. Then, because with all the data we are receiving, the, I, I believe that the most uh, uh, trustworthy thing we have is the model of the ship. It's not the data. And, and we believe that we have to model the ship and the response in the waves, and, and we have to get better ideas of ocean currents and all that. But we cannot do that through artificial intelligence. We have to have proper physical mathematical modeling of what is going on and then relate all the data to that. And that's what I mean by human intelligence and not artificial intelligence. Uh, Jacob, I can only agree with what you're saying. And uh, I mean, for us, because we, we of course, use uh, some, uh, some basic AI, some ML uh, on our side, but ultimately everything is underpinned on uh, naval architecture principles uh, and, and the digital twin. Uh, in the same way that uh, we use telemetry to enrich our manual data, in the same way that we like to use artificial intelligence to to assist us uh, with uh, the automation of certain tasks, especially when it comes to large amounts of data, it can be too laborious to, to be done uh, in, in other manners. Uh, but yes, ultimately, small, uh, small widgets like the one uh, I briefly showed with the uh, uh, the prediction of when the next hull cleaning should be done. You know, these are small, neat uh, machine learning applications. The the approach of uh, auto logging and throwing everything into uh, a, a black box ultimately is something I don't agree with, and uh, I think I'm with fully with you on that. <laughs> and of course, I'm not saying that artificial intelligence cannot be used, but I'm just saying that it's not going to solve all problems. You still have that's to. correct. You have to have human intelligence before you, you use artificial intelligence. Uh, so so, so that, that's what I mean with human intelligence, yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. But to, to, to be clear, and uh, uh, you do get some extremely good results from uh, auto-logging with uh, machine learning in cases where you don't have a digital twin available for, for your model. You can get some extremely precise results. Um, I think this brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, I, I looked at uh, the, the list of attendees at some point. Uh, of course, I could not see them all, but we, I think we picked around 300. So I think we got some pretty good participation. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you for spending so much time with us, actually, because we were supposed to be 90 minutes and we went over two hours. So thank you very much and wish you all a very good afternoon. Thank you to our hosts and thank you to our sponsors. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you.